Hello, welcome back to Neural Data Science. I'm Professor Aaron Newman, and today continues our single unit data chapter. Today we're going to be learning about the effects of light intensity on spike rate and working with a larger data set than we did in the last lesson to understand how we can work with a larger data set and how we can plot many raster plots and peristimulus time histograms at once. So our learning objectives for today are to understand spike train data in what we call a sparse format, where we just have the timing of each individual spike rather than zeros and ones representing every time point. We're going to learn how to select data for a specific intensity level within that format, how to plot raster plots and peristimulus time histograms for specific intensity levels, plot raster plots and peristimulus time histograms for all intensity levels, we're going to learn how to use matplotlib subplots to visualize multivariate data, how to format a complex matplotlib figure with appropriate labeling and scales, and how to use a combination of raster and peristimulus time histogram plots to make inferences about the relationship between an experimentally manipulated variable and spike rate and timing. So the data set we're working with here is, again, simulated data, but it builds on the example from the last lesson. So we're using a data set that we call 10 intensities. It's the same idea that we're measuring from a single neuron. We're looking at spiking uh, across many trials. And on each trial, the neuron is stimulated by 550 nanometer light. It's an optogenetically engineered neuron. So it's engineered to respond by firing probabilistically to this wavelength of light. And in this experiment, we varied the intensity across 10 levels from a very low intensity to a very high intensity of that 550 nanometer light. And so what we're looking for is, does the neuron show an increase in spike rate with the intensity of the light? And we predict that it will. This data set is adapted from Nyland and Walsh's Neural Data Science book, but all of the code and the lesson is unique to this course. So we'll start by importing the necessary packages. So we're going to import matplotlib dot pyplot as plt. We're going to import numpy as np, and we're going to import pandas as pd. So we'll be working with our data set in a pandas data frame for the most part. And we're going to define some experimental variables that we know of, so set some specific parameters that we're going to use later on. So we know that the stimulus came on at 4 milliseconds after the start of the trial. And we know that the stimulus went off at 14 milliseconds. We're setting the parameters a little different from the last lesson where we had the stimulus duration, and then later we calculated the stimulus off time. It's just a little more convenient to do it this way for this lesson. Number of trials is equal to 10. So we have 10 trials at each intensity level. And we know that we have 21 time points in each trial. So we're going to hard code that into a variable. In the previous lesson, we did derive the number of trials and the number of time points from the data. But as you'll see, for specific reasons with the way that we're representing the data today, that's not uh, really feasible, and we do have to hard code these as variables. And that's easy to do because we already know, having run the experiment or knowing about the experiment, we know what those parameters are. OK, so. We have 10 trials across 10 intensity levels, so 100 trials overall. That's a lot of data. We're not going to paste it in or try and type it in. We're going to read it in from a CSV file. So we're going to read it into a data frame called spikes, and we're going to use pandas.read CSV. The data is in a data folder, so it's data slash 10 intensities dot CSV. And you can see there, because we're using pd.readcsv, the result is that spikes is a pandas data frame. So let's look at the data and understand what the structure of it is. This is always a good thing when you read in a data set. So spikes.head, let's see what the first five lines are. So you can see we've got three columns, intensity, trial, and spike time. So right away you see that this is different from the way we represented the data in the last lesson. In the last lesson, we started with a list and we ended up with a NumPy array where each trial, we had a data point for each time point in the trial. So each trial, we had 21 time points, so 21 bits of data. And each one was either a zero if there was no spike or a one if there was a spike. In this 
data set instead, we only have rows in the data frame where spikes actually occurred. So you can see in this first row, we have the intensity is zero, the trial number is one, and there's a spike time of 14, and then also zero intensity, trial one, there's a spike at 18 milliseconds. So rather than using a data point to represent every time point in the data set, we only store data for those time points where there's spikes. And since most of the time points don't involve a spike overall in the data set, this is a much more efficient way of storing the data. So rather than having to store every time point, regardless of whether there's information there or not, we only store the information for the time points where a spike actually occurred. So it's a dramatically smaller data file. And you can imagine that if on you know, a given trial, there's only say three spikes or four spikes or even 10 spikes, but we have 21 time points, we're cutting the size of our data file more or less in half or maybe by a third, like you know, by 67%, 75%. So as the number of trials we have goes up, the savings in terms of the amount of storage that's required uh, increase as well. So it's a very efficient way to store the data. So the next thing we'll do, and we're missing a cell, I'll have to add it here, is look at a random sample of the data. So we looked at the first five rows. We see that it's organized by intensity and trial. You'll notice also that there's no trial two entry here. That is because no spikes occurred at zero intensity on trial two. So again, simpler and more sparse representation of the data, more efficient because we're not even storing data for trial two because nothing happened. Okay, so spikes.sample, and we'll say 25. So let's just look at 25 random rows to get a better sense of kind of what's in the data frame. So we can see that intensity, we've got levels like eight, three, four, nine, seven. And for trials, we have eight, one, four, two, seven, one. So clearly variation in intensity levels and trials and spike times. And if we look at the overall size of the data frame, so we say spikes.shape, and remember we don't give it parentheses for that command because this is a property of the data frame that we're asking for. It's not a method that we're applying to the data frame. And what you see is that the data frame has 231 rows and three columns. Three columns we already knew, but now we know that we have basically 231 spikes in our entire data set. So let's think about that if we have 10 intensities, and we have 10 trials, so that's 100 trials overall. Each trial is 21 milliseconds long. So if we use the sort of rich data format that we used in the previous lesson, where we had a zero or a one for every time point on every trial, we would need to have 21 time points times 100 trials overall. So that's 2100 data points that we would have to have. And here, instead, we're storing 231 data points. Now, times three columns, but still, it's a dramatically smaller data set. So we've looked at a random sample of the data, but now let's look a little more systematically and just see what are the unique values of intensity. So essentially, what are the different intensity levels in the data frame? So we'll say spikes, square bracket, intensity, dot unique. And you can see our unique levels are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So we know we have 10 intensity levels and they're just numbered sequentially from zero. So we do spikes, square bracket, trial, dot unique. And we have one, three, five, four, they're not ordered. So that's a bit annoying but it looks like we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So again, we have the numbers zero to nine, but the way when we ask for them as unique values, they're not sorted. That's because when we run unique, it's gonna go through the data frame top to bottom. And as we observed, like for the first trial of the lowest intensity level zero, there was no data for trial two. So two doesn't get stuck in there until it finds a trial where there was actually data on trial number two. So that's fine, but later on when we wanna work systematically with trials, we're gonna to have to sort that array. So let's move into visualizing the data and generating a raster plot like we did for the previous experiment. Now we're gonna start by 
working with a subset of the data. So we're going to take the data just for intensity level 9, which is the most intense level of light. So we expect the most spike in if there is a relationship between spike rate and light intensity. So we're going to call this DAT, and this is just a subset of the data that we'll create to work with for convenience. So that's going to be spikes where spikes square bracket intensity equals equals 9. So in other words, we want the spikes data frame, but only where the value in the intensity column is equivalent to 9. Now that we have that data, we can work with it and generate a subplot. So we'll do fig and x equals plt dot subplots. So first we're going to draw our shaded area with plt dot ax v span stim on stim off alpha is equal to 0 0.5 and the color is green yellow so now we're going to loop through trials so for trial that's our loop variable in sorted remember i said we have to sort our trial values dat square bracket trial dot unique then our spike times on a given trial are going to be the data where dat square bracket trial is equal to the current trial number. And outside of those square brackets, we're going to end with another set of square brackets and put spike time. And that's because, remember, we're selecting from a pandas data frame with three columns, but we only want the spike time data and not the other two columns. So this last square bracket spike time selects just that column from the subset of data defined by that trial. And then we say axe.vlines to draw our ticks. And we'll put those at spike times. And we'll draw the lines from trial minus 0 0.4 to trial plus 0 0.4. In the last lesson, we used plus or minus 0.5. Here we'll use 0.4 just because that ensures that there's little gaps between the tick marks for each trial. And finally, plt.show. So there's our raster plot. Not a lot different from what we saw in the previous lesson, except maybe there's more spikes than there were in the previous one. This is a high intensity of light, and it's just a different data set. So that's our raster. Now we'll see how to draw a peristimulus time histogram. And we're going to draw it a little differently than we did in the last lesson. In the last lesson, we just summed the number of spikes in each time bin. So we went, we had a NumPy array of data. So it was a square array. And each row was a trial, and each column was a time point. So we could just sum or compute the mean across all of the rows in a particular column. And that would be the number of spikes at that time point. Now, since we have the sparse data set, our data is not organized in a way that we can do that. So we have to use a different approach to calculating the histograms. And the easiest way is to use matplotlibs.hist method. So this allows us to generate a histogram directly in a plot. So let's see how to do that. We'll say fig comma x equals plt.subplots, plt.ax vspan, stim on, stim off. Uh, is 0 0.5 and color is green yellow and now let's draw our histogram so dat spike time dot plot so I said we were going to use dot hist we're actually going to use dot plot with a hist quarg kind equals hist and that has to be in quote marks and we're going to explicitly tell it what the bins are for the histogram because by default, a histogram routine will compute the number of bins automatically based on the data that it gets. But the issue is that because we have spikes occurring at different times, if it only looks at the data for one intensity level, 
the first spike is probably not going to be at time zero and the last spike is probably not going to be at time 20. So it's not going to scale the bins across the entire time range. And it's probably going to have different size bins, different number of bins, etc., for different trials. So in this case, we want to say bins is equal to the range from zero to the number of time points in steps of one. So we'll have one millisecond bins going from zero to the number of time points that we defined as an experimental parameter at the start of the lesson. And then plt.show. And there we go. So looks like a histogram. We have the time of the stimulus was on. We have an x-axis that goes from zero to 20, so that's great. Later on, we'll worry about labeling the graph. But for now, let's combine the raster and the peristimulus time histogram in a single figure with two subplots. So fig comma axs is equal to plt.subplots. And where we're going with this lesson is we want to plot all intensity levels. And so the way we're going to arrange that plot ultimately is with the raster plots in the left-hand column and the peristimulus time histograms in the right-hand column and then rows for each intensity level. So in the last lesson, we plotted the raster plot above the peristimulus time histogram. Here, we'll plot them side by side. So we're gonna say that we want one row of plots and two columns, and we're also gonna hard code a figure size rather than have that determined automatically. And we'll say that's 15 by four. Next line is axs zero dot ax dot ax v span. Stim on, stim off. Alpha is 0.5, color is green, yellow. Our data is, so this time we're actually selecting the data internally even though we already did that above, so dat right now is actually spikes for our intensity level nine. But I'm putting this in now because later we're gonna plot all intensity levels. So we wanna be able to select our data for each intensity level within this plotting command. Okay, so spikes, square bracket spikes. So spikes where spikes intensity is equal to nine. Next, we're going to loop through trials to plot our raster plot. So for trial, unsorted, dat trial dot unique. Pull out the spike times. So that's gonna be dat where dat trial is equivalent to the current trial number and pull out only the spike time column and then draw the raster. So this is axs square bracket zero dot v lines spike times and then we want to do trial number minus 0.4 to trial number plus 0 0.4. And now I'm going to add a comment in here to indicate that this is now the peristimulus time histogram. And so axs square bracket one, the other subplot, ax dot v span, stim on, stim off. Alpha equals 0 0.5, color is green, yellow. And then we'll actually draw our histogram. So this time we actually use the dot hist plotting method. And dat spike time. Command's the same, except other than saying dot plot and then kind equals hist, we just say dot hist. Bins is equal to range zero and 
going up to the number of time points in steps of one. And finally, show the plot. And there's our plots side by side. They're both plots we've seen before. Now they're just together. So the next thing we're going to do is plot all of our intensity levels. So like I said, rather than just one row of plots, we're going to have 10 rows of plots looking like the one we just did. So for this, let's define intensity levels as a variable. So int levels is equal to sorted spikes intensity dot unique. So now we've got that variable that we can loop through. Okay, so for this next part, I'm going to take all the code that we just ran, copy it, and paste it. Again, it's good practice to type the code in. And so if you want to pause and do that yourself, it really is good for your brain and for your learning. But for the sake of convenience here, I'm going to paste that in and just talk through what we're going to change from the previous plot to make this a loop that goes through all of the intensity levels. So the first thing is we need to change our subplots command because we don't just have one row, but we want as many rows as we have intensity levels. So I could hard code that as 10 because I know that, but it's often good practice to be able to pull parameters like that out of your data, just in case you want to reuse the code later or you're using it on multiple data sets that might maybe have different numbers of intensity levels or whatever your variable is. So we'll say len int levels, and then it'll just pull that out. Okay, and we still want two columns, but we do want a different figure size because it needs to be much taller now to accommodate the many rows. So we'll say 12 by 12. And then beyond that, everything that we're going to do outside of plt.show, we want to indent. So I'm highlighting and then on a Mac, command and the right square bracket on a PC, control and the right square bracket will indent that highlighted block of code by one tab stop. So above that, I want to put in my loop. So for i in int levels. So now we're going to cycle through all of the intensity levels. And we're going to say now, as we did up above, actually things are in a different order in my example than they were up above. So we're going to go down to this line where we had dat and say dat equals spike, spikes intensity equals, but instead of nine, we're going to say i, so that each time through this loop, that is a different value. And let me highlight this vSpan bit. And in my example, I've drawn it after drawing the raster. So let's plot it, paste it down there. We'll modify that in a minute. But let's just look at for trial in our unique trials. We're going to take out the spike times. So all of that's really the same because that is operating on dat. And dat we changed already to update each time through the loop. Then AX vSpan, stim on, stim off, alpha equals 0.5, color equals yellow, green, yellow, sorry. The one thing we're going to change here is in the example here, you can see it's i divided by 10 plus 0.1. So what's that doing? Well, what that's doing is saying that rather than having the intensity of that background shading just be the same for all our trials, it's going to vary with the intensity level of the stimulus. So in other words, we're using the color of that shading to indicate the color of the stimulus, but now we're also using the transparency or essentially sort of the brightness of that shading to indicate the intensity level. So because I is our intensity level, I divided by 10. So when I is zero, I divided by 10 is zero. So we add 0.1 to that because if the alpha was zero, the color would be invisible. So we want it slightly more than invisible. And then that will scale up. Uh, so when I is one, it'll be one over 10 plus 0.1, et cetera, et cetera. Moving on to our peristimulus time histogram. And the other thing I did forget to change is that when we're specifying our axes now, it's a 2D plot. So we need to specify two indexes, one for the rows, one for the columns. 
The columns are going to be the same every time we plot something. We want column zero to be the raster, column one to be the peristimulus time histograms. But the row is going to be adaptive based on which intensity level. And that's encoded by i. So we'll say i comma zero so that it updates each time. And the same with the axe v-span command there. Now for the peristimulus time histogram again, i comma one, i comma one, and the v-span again, we're gonna copy and paste this bit of code. So rather than a fixed intensity or fixed alpha, it's gonna vary with the intensity of the stimulus. And then for the histogram, everything's the same because again, dat is being updated each time and we're just doing a histogram of dat. And then the last thing is on our final line, we're going to say plt dot, or second from final line, tight layout. And that'll just prevent our plot elements from overlapping each other. Run that. But now you can see we've got different rows, different intensities of our background shading, rasters on the left, peristimulus time histograms on the right. There are some issues with this plot though. In particular, you may notice that the green shaded area isn't in the same place on all of our subplots. And that's because if you look at the x-axis on these subplots, it doesn't always start at zero and it doesn't always go till 20 either. And that's again, because these plots auto scale to the range of data that's provided to them. For the histograms, we specified our bins as going from zero to the length of the trial. So those are all gonna be set anyway. But for the raster plots, we're going to need to force the issue and make them all the same X scale. The other thing that we're going to want to change eventually is the height of the bars in the histograms. So here again, matplotlib is auto scaling the Y axis to the range of the data that it has for each subplot. So in the lowest intensity level, the most number of spikes we ever have on a given time point is three. So it auto scales to three. Whereas at the highest intensity levels, we have as many as six, possibly seven, four, seven, eight even spikes. So these are gonna auto scale to six or seven or eight. And because of that, it looks like there's a lot of spiking, an equivalent amount of spiking at the lowest intensity level as at the higher intensity levels, but that's an artifact of the auto scaling. So let's address those issues one at a time, starting by the x-axis. The critical thing that we're going to do here is when we define the figure with subplots, we're going to say share x equals true. And that will force all of the subplots to share the same x-axis scale. Everything else is pretty much the same. So let's again copy and paste our code block down below and add that comma share x equals true. We're also gonna add one further line, and that's because even though the x-axis in the peristimulus time histograms goes from zero to 20, and share x will force all of the axes to basically, uh, all of the x-axes to cover the widest range possible. So whichever plot has the widest range of values on x, share x will force all of the other plots subplots to have that same range. But if you look at where the tick marks are, we have 0, 2.5, 5, 5 7.5, etc. Using these 0.5 positions as tick marks doesn't make a lot of sense because we're recording data on the sort of even 0 0.0 milliseconds, not the half milliseconds. So we're also going to use dot set x ticks to force the tick marks to be at specific positions on the x-axis. And we'll do that for the peristimulus time histograms, and that'll get adopted because of share x to the rasters as well. So here we're going to say axs square bracket i comma 1 dot set x ticks. And for this, we're going to use np dot a range, which is like the range function, but it's a numpy version of it. np dot a range. 0, comma, num tp plus 1. So I wanted to actually go to the number of time points plus 1, just so there's a bit of uh, padding or spacing at the, the right side of the axis. And the last argument there is the step size. I'm going to say 2. So we're going to have tick marks at 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, etc. Run that. 
Okay, so now at the bottom, you can see that on both the rasters and the peristimulus time histograms, we go from zero to 20, and the tick marks are in steps of two. And now all of our shaded areas are nicely aligned across the plots. The next thing we want to do is address this Y scale issue. So again, we've got a nice block of code. We're going to copy that and build on it rather than typing it all in from scratch. And we could have used share Y. There is a share Y quarg, just like there's a share X, but we actually don't want that because share Y would force all of the Y axes to share the same scale. But we actually want the raster plot y-axis to go from 0 to 9, basically, because we have 10 trials, and y-axis is trial number for the raster plots. But for the peristimulus time histograms, we want to adaptively scale the y-axis to the range of the plot or the subplot that has the highest number of spikes in it. So the way we're going to do that is using an accumulator variable. This is something that we showed in the lesson on for loops, but we're going to put it to good use here. So basically what we're going to do is initialize a variable called ymax as zero before we start our loop of, of plots. And each time we plot, when we get down to the histogram, we're going to plot it. And then we're going to use a plot method in matplotlib called getylim, which just returns the minimum and maximum values on the y-axis for that particular plot. We're going to save those as cur underscore min and cur underscore max. The min we don't care about, but get ylim returns both the min and the max, so we have to assign those outputs to something. And then here you'll see if cur max is greater than y max, y max equals cur max. So in other words, if the current y axis maximum is greater than whatever we had stored previously as the maximum y value, we're going to update our maximum y value to be that of the current plot. So it'll step through all the plots and find the maximum across all of the plots. And then at the end, we're gonna, we've are gonna we looped through all the intensity levels once, we've drawn all our plots, figured out what the maximum Y value is, and then we're gonna quickly loop through all of the intensity levels again and set the Y limit on all of the peristimulus time histograms, so the column one subplots, to have that Y maximum and a Y minimum of zero. Okay, so let's make those modifications to the plot. So y underscore max equals zero outside of our for loop for intensity levels. And then when we go in after we draw the histogram, so right here, I am going to say cur underscore min comma cur underscore max equals excess square bracket. So the current intensity level column one of the subplot get y limb. And then we're going to update if necessary. So if the current maximum is greater than the y max, y max equals cur max. And then, like I say, outside of that loop through intensity levels, because we want to get through all the intensity levels once to figure out what the maximum y is in the histograms across all intensity levels. Now we're going to loop through intensity levels again. I've done for a in intensity levels. I actually could have just done for i in intensity levels again. Um, in fact, that makes a little more logical sense. In int levels, xs i one dot set y limb, and the minimum y is zero, and then the max is y max. And there we go. So now if you look at the peristimulus time histograms, you can see that they're all on the same scale. And now those low intensity levels, it's clear that there's a lot less spiking than on the higher intensity levels. Finally, and let's go back again and copy and paste our code because it's just the same code with some elaboration. In fact, as you can see here, quite a bit of elaboration. So what we're gonna do now is just add labels to our plots as appropriate. So the critical changes here are we're going to label the y-axis with the intensity level. So at each intensity level, we're going to label the y-axis with that intensity level. So after drawing the raster plot, we're going to say axs square bracket i comma zero dot set y label. 
and it's going to be intensity and then whatever the actual intensity level is, so I. And we're going to put I in parentheses and run the string function on it because again, I is an integer and when we're combining a string with an integer, we need to convert the integer to a string. Okay, so now we've labeled each y-axis uh, separately based on what its intensity level is. Next thing we're going to do is place the title only above the first row of plots. So if i is equal to 0, so if i is equivalent to 0, we're going to say axs i zero square brackets dot set title because we don't need a title across every subplot we just want to title the whole column of subplots as rasters so raster plot for each intensity and i'm adding an additional quarg here font size equals 10 so that we can control that so it doesn't get too big or, or too small Next thing we want to do is label the y-axis for the peristimulus time histograms. So here, after, let's see, we could put it kind of anywhere, but we'll put it here. So axs i1, to reference that guy, is set y-label, and we'll set it to num spikes. I'm using abbreviations because the subplots are so small that the full word number would probably not fit very well. As with the rasters, we want to place the title for this column of plots only above the first row of plots. So if i is 0, we're going to say axs square bracket i1 dot set title is PSTH for each intensity. And again, font size is 10. And the last thing I'm going to do is do fig.subtitle. So this will title the whole figure. We'll make that effects of 550 nanometer light intensity on spike rate. And just before I run it, I realized I made one typo, which is up in this line where we're setting the Y label, I said intensity comma string I. That's not going to work because it's going to interpret that as intensity is the first argument to set Y label and the string of I is the second argument. So here it shouldn't be comma, I should say plus string I. AXS square bracket I comma zero. So we set the Y limits on the peristimulus time histograms. I want to do this on the raster plots as well, because even though we have 10 trials for every intensity level, so the Y limit should be the same, the way it's going to generate the plots is a bit wonky. So we want to force the Y limits to be from zero to the number of trials, which is an experimental parameter that we defined at the top of the file. And this is one of those things that I figured out through trial and error. Okay, there you have it. So now we have a plot with effects of 550 nanometer light intensity on spike rate as the overall title, and then titles for each column of subplots. The y-axes for the peristimulus time histograms are labeled as number of spikes. They're all on the same scale. The rasters are all labeled with the intensity level that they correspond to. And we can infer from a graph like this that that applies across the entire row, so to the peristimulus time histograms as well. And we can see that we forced our y-axes to all be the same, x-axes all the same. So this is looking great. So that's really the end of the lesson. We're going to close out by just looking at this plot and actually figuring out, okay, now that we've done all this work and got a really nice looking plot, what does it even mean? What is the data telling us? So remember that the question that we were asking with the data was, what's the effect of stimulus intensity on spike rate? And so we plotted the data two ways with rasters, with peristimulus time histograms. 
And in both, it's pretty clear that the spike rate does increase at higher intensity levels relative to low intensity levels. And you can see that for the first few intensity levels, really there's almost no spiking during the stimulus. If there is an increase in spiking, it's very small, and it seems to come like right at the end of the stimulus, which seems like maybe not a relationship with the stimulus at all. Or maybe there's an offset effect, but not really an onset effect at these low intensity levels. However, there seems to be a threshold around intensity three or four, whereby you start to see spiking during the stimulus at those intensity levels. And definitely by intensity five, six, seven, eight, nine, you definitely get an increase in spike rate. And it seems to go up. So it's not just that it's either spiking in response to the stimulus or not, but the more intense the stimulus is, the more spikes you get. Uh, not in a directly linear fashion, it seems like, because it seems like a low rate of spiking at four, five, and six, and then kind of a high but fairly similar level. So our maximum number of spikes is about seven or eight in all of the three highest intensity levels. What does change a little more systematically with intensity level, though, is the timing. So if you look at nine, the spiking occurs pretty early, maybe around seven milliseconds relative to time zero, so three milliseconds after the stimulus comes on. But if we step down in intensity, that onset of spiking and the peak spike count time seems to get later and later. So it seems like the light intensity does impact the spike rate, but it also impacts the latency to first spike. And the latency gets shorter, so the neuron starts responding more quickly when the intensity is higher. We also do see these offset effects. So there's, you know, in the baseline period, there's very little spiking at all. But there does seem to be a lot more spiking after the stimulus goes off relative to that baseline period. Maybe again affected by light intensity and in that the lowest levels induce low levels of post-stimulus spiking, whereas the higher intensity levels do seem to induce higher levels of post-stimulus spiking. That's pretty much as far as we're going to take it today. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.